Uh, I have to confess, I'm feeling a, uh, a bit of vulnerability up here. It's a, a, lot, a tough act to follow. Um, you know, Steve, Steve began this by talking about his personal uh, journey for a bit. And I, I have to say, as someone who trained as a physician and a scientist, uh, a basic scientist, if you were to have told me 10 years ago that I'd be sitting up on stage at the National Academy of Medicine talking about love, <laughs> talking about vulnerability, I, I, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, and to have Dr. Zhao start the day by talking about his commitment and also his personal journey, to have the former Surgeon General, right? Like, what, what is happening? Um, <laughs> So I, I, I just want to give a sacred pause to, to just honor that um, and give incredible thanks to the National Academy of Medicine and to all of you. Uh, just, this is, um, uh, you know, this is real, guys. This is, you know, this is a movement. This is what it looks like. Um, so I will be super brief because I, I want to have time for Q&A. Um, uh, Dr. Zhao asked me to lead the publications uh, team to make the invisible a bit more visible. Um, and I have to give incredible credit to the National Academy of Medicine staff on the art show. I'm supportive, but that's uh, all of them. So in terms of products, uh, there are three I want to focus on for this audience. One came from uh, Dr. Zhao, Dr. Naska, and Dr. Kirch, chair, uh, chair and co-chairs, on framing the issue to care is human, published uh, January 25th, 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the key point here for this audience is to me this highlighted the value proposition of the Action Collaborative. This isn't about point solutions and ad hoc thinking. This is about a true systems orientation that's going to take leadership, that's going to take everyone here across generations and professions to make happen. And I love the analogy to Air is Human two decades ago. So second, I'll, I'll direct your attention to commentary three. So if, if we're going to have to have everyone on board to do this, we're going to need multiple professions. But something that's actually missing a bit in the literature is we're going to need different generations of clinicians to come together. So we've teamed up with Jordan Feingold. I don't know if she's here, a medical student. She's in the back. And Tim Brigham, who's chief of staff of ACGME, to put an attention and a focus on how do you have a conversation between generations. <coughs> so we actually noted, if we're really honest about it, we noted that sometimes when young trainees raise questions about wellness, there's often the, uh, I'll call it the back in my day conversation. Well, you know, you, know, you don't know how tough it was. Uh, ba back in my day, and we heard hints about this in, in the earlier session on social hierarchy. So today, we're gonna take this head on. I don't know if you know, but we're, there's a breakout group from 2.45 to, I think, 5.45, three hours, where Tim and Jordan are going to model what a conversation between generations and between professions, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy, what that looks like. Uh, just a show of hands, who here identifies as a student? Pharmacy, dentistry, nursing, medicine. Who here identifies as a resident or a fellow? graduate, okay. Who here identifies, and this is uh, tricky, uh, an early stage clinician? Junior faculty, young attending. Who here uh, identifies as a late stage? It sounds odd, but a late stage. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of late stage. <laughs> I, I, there's no middle stage yet. Maybe we need to address that. Uh, so uh, today we're going to try to engender a safe space uh, to discuss this. The, the proceedings of this conversation, the proceedings of this conversation, again, led by uh, uh, students, will be uh, published as a commentary theme. So I'm very proud of that. It shows true engagement of all developmental stages from early to late. And the next um, topic is commentary two. Um, and and Daryl alluded to this a bit earlier. How many of you in the audience have heard of a chief wellness officer? Okay, this is sort of a converted audience. Okay, uh, it'd, be, it'd be useful to poll online too. Um, how many here are a chief wellness officer? All right. So look at that gap. Look at that gap. <laughs> right? So we, we have a lot of people have heard about this. So we thought it is time. It is time to actually make the case for a chief wellness officer for American health systems. And at the end of the day, you need a leader who's empowered and emboldened 
by the C-suite, the CEO, the dean, with a budget, with authority, and scope to actually do this. This should not be token. This should be central to the bloodstream of the institution. And we, <laughs> So, you know, as, as Daryl has mentioned to me before, we've seen this before, and as, as Dr. Zhao talked about in the morning, we've seen this with quality. Now, with, there's a patient safety day affirmed by the World Health Organization and others. So, what would, does that now look like? So, we, we're going to provide three reasons. Um, it's the right thing to do. We're going to talk about a business case, and then we're also going to talk about the regulatory and accreditation implications. I'm getting noticed that it's time for me to stop soon, so um, I, I will pause. But the, the key thing I wanted to show you here were the authorship behind this call to action for a chief wellness officer. This includes current chief wellness officers. It includes former deans, CEOs, and most importantly, current deans and CEOs of esteemed institutions across this country who are making the commitment for a chief wellness officer. Thank you.